Hey everyone, this is Two Sheep One Wheat and I'm Chrissy. Today's video is going to be just a little bit different. I'm going to be highlighting a company called Coldstream Games. They're Canadian company. They are, they are a designer and a publishing company and they are from British Columbia. So let's get to it. Video. Why can't I get that? No. I'm going to redo that. So I was scrolling through Kickstarter one day and I came across a Canadian game, Klondike, the Canadian Gold Rush game. And I took a note at what the company was and I reached out to them because I love a Canadian company. I wanted to review some games for them, get their name out there for them. So today, um, they actually sent me two games of theirs, two of their earlier games for me to review it for you guys. So the first one that we're gonna be doing is the heist it is the museum of fine art so this game is for two to five players and there's a few different ways that you can play this game depending on how many players you play with so first it is if you're playing for two players one is going to be the art thief and the other one is going to be playing the guards from the art museum now, if you're playing with more than two players, everybody's going to be taking a turn at being the thief and whoever makes it out with the most amount of art is who wins. Now, in a two-player game, if the thief is caught, then the guards win. And if the thief makes it out with the artwork, then the thief wins. So let's get into the board. Now, first things for this game, you're gonna want to set the museum up. So what you're doing is you're placing all of the security cameras and you're gonna want to have them all with the green facing upwards. And I'll get to that a little bit later. So after you place all of your cameras around the four different rooms here, we have the basement, the main floor, the second floor, and then the third floor, you're gonna be going around and you're gonna be placing all of these art paintings and pictures all around all the different floors. Once you have completed that, then you are going to let the thief know, hey, the museum is now closed. So what the thief is going to be doing is set up their game. You're gonna to want to use this pad right here and this is the layout of the art museum. And what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be taking a note of where all of the artworks are located in all four floors. And you're gonna be writing that down by an A for artwork. So you're gonna go ahead and write that down on this board. And then you're also going to be taking a note of where all of the security cameras are and they are all numbered. So you can just go ahead and put them in here and then circle them. You're gonna to wanna to circle them so that you can differentiate your steps as you're walking through the museum and you wanna know what is a camera and what is your footsteps, how you're walking through the building. So as you're doing this, you're gonna be using this right here so that nobody on the table can see what you are doing. And this actually has a whole bunch of information here for you and how you're going to be marking things off on the giant notepad. And it'll give you a couple different folks that you are able to play. Now, all of them come with different abilities. So you'll have to go ahead and figure out which one that you're gonna play with. And depending on that, um, one of these characters get a special die. This die right here has an extra unlock button or unlock option on the die here. So what you're doing is you're rolling these dies when you're the thief. And this is going to let you know if you're gonna be escaping through whichever door or window based on whatever floor you're on. So if you get the unlock, that means that you get to get out, you have won, you made out with some artwork. Now if you get the lock right here, then you must try another door or window. Now a few of the options that you can play with the game are just on the back of your card here for whenever you are playing one of the guards. You also get a die and you would be rolling this for your movement. So now after you roll, you can do a visual check of the room, or I guess after you roll and move, you can do a visual check of the room you're in. You can check a single camera on any floor. So whichever floor that you're on, you can check a single camera. So let's say your last turn you checked a camera and it was off. You can now repair that one single disabled camera. But let's say you made your way into the basement and into the IT room, you are able to look at all of the cameras on all of the floors. And you can also fix all of the cameras 
whichever ones that are uh, broken whenever you are in the IT room. Now down here, it also gives you a little bit of tips based on the thieves, potentially on which one that, um, that player who's playing the thief could be. So it gives you a little bit of tips on them. Now, if at any given time that you are in a room or the hall and you say that you are doing a check of the room, then the thief has to say there's nothing to see here or if he is in that room, he gets placed on the board and essentially he's been caught. Now let's just say that you are in the room and you didn't decide to check the room for the thief and you decided to just check one of the cameras. Now the way that the cameras work, oh wow, he lost his pants. The way that the cameras work is that it is wall to wall in a straight line. Say we were checking camera number seven and the thief was here, he would be caught because he is in the eyesight for the camera. But if he was in this location right here, there are no cameras that would see him in that line. So he would be safe and the thief would then state that there is nothing to see in this room. And if you are in a room and you are checking it, you're doing a room check and the thief has taken a piece of art, then that artwork would be removed whenever you say that you're checking the room. That way you know that the thief was in there and he already has one piece of artwork. So now he could either be trying to get another piece of artwork, a second piece, or he could be trying to escape. So now you're kind of on a mission and you need to know where the thief is. Otherwise, I feel like in a couple of rounds, you're gonna be losing. So in a two player setup, one guard would go, they would roll, move, check the room or check the camera, and then the thief would go. And then for the second turn, but third turn, that is when your second guard would go. So it's kind of giving you an option to cover more grounds. So if you are the guards, you are trying to find the thief and arrest him so that he cannot make away with any precious art. And if you are the thief, you have to make it out with at least one piece of artwork. And if you do that, then you win the game at a two player game. Or if you're playing for more players, whoever, whatever thief makes out with the most amount of artwork is the player who wins. So I will mention one of the rules that might have just been a little confusing. So I did double check just to make sure that we were playing the game correctly. So one of the thieves, this person right here, this Brenislav, I hope I'm saying that right. If anybody knows how to pronounce that, let me know. Anyway, this one here, he can disable any camera that he walks by. Now to clarify, walking by is walking directly underneath of the camera. So that would mean walking on top of the camera in the same slot as it. He can disable any of those cameras. Now, whenever you're disabling cameras, there is a spot right here on your sheet right here, your uh, blueprint of the art gallery. So you can just mark that off right here so that you can keep track of which ones are on and off. And then anytime that the guards would turn it back on, you just need to make note for yourself to make it easier for you. Now, since you are rolling dice in this game, Now, since you're rolling dice in this game, there is a lot to do with luck. And it's not very strategic because you don't necessarily know how to go about it since you're trying to cover four different rooms and the thief is dressed in all black and you cannot see them. So when you're rolling your die, you might not get as many movements as you want when you're trying to get somewhere. And same goes with the thief. The thief is rolling the die that allows him to unlock or not lock or not unlock to get out of a window or a door. So potentially you could be chasing around the thief thinking you know where they're going and the thief could potentially be running around the whole building just trying to escape with at least one piece of artwork. And it is quite a big, large um, board. So you could be completely missing the mark, completely missing it. So I feel like time-wise, whenever you're playing this game, it can definitely vary depending how lucky or how unlucky you get. Now I've only played this game at two players and I feel like the more players, the better almost. And I can kind of understand why at a two player game, you're playing with two characters versus just the one. And I also understand then why when you're playing at say a five player game, why you are rotating the thief. 
Now, playing as the guard in the last game like I did, I got pretty frustrated trying to chase Nick around the board because he was playing as the thief. So I got a little frustrated trying to find him because it is quite a large board and I did have two characters on the board trying to find them. And strategy wise, I feel like separating would be the best way to do it. Total um, scary movie move to separate and whatever they try to do. But anyways, worked out eventually for me. I'll give you that. It did work out eventually for me. And the feeling that I got trying to find this thief, I was devoted to try to find it. And I was getting frustrated and I was feeling just a whole bunch of emotions. And I love when that happens in a game because it actually, it just makes me feel like I'm getting so into the game. I'm so devoted to it and something needs to happen and I get excited, I get off my chair and that's exactly what happened with this game. It was a lot, a lot of fun and and it's like a crime theme, you know, someone's breaking in, you have guards going out and overall it was just a really fun time. I really enjoyed playing this game. So for us, when we got this game in, we were playing at night obviously after the children had gone to bed and because it's so based on luck, we got a couple of games in and they varied so much in time frame. We got a game in that was really short and we got a game in that was like probably double the length. And I feel like because of the way that this game is, it kind of wants you to play more. It gets you, it draws you in, right? It's getting you to want to play more games. So be prepared with this game. Um, I feel like you can't just get one game in and it just draws you in, which is similar to their other game, which I'll get to right now. So the second game that I was sent by Coldstream Games is Steamrolled. Now, Steamrolled is for one to eight players. It's kind of a dice rolling game. You're betting, you're trying to move your pawns up a track, and whoever has the highest in that track and area controls it and gains the pot. So let's get to it. So this game is for one to eight players. So here are all the different colors of pawns that you can choose from. So you would select your pawn, and whichever one you choose will be the one that you play with. Uh, let's go with the pink and the or the purple and the blue. So next, whenever you have chosen your pawns, you're gonna be rolling your dice, and this will determine which lane that you're going into, which would be this one, whichever lane that's chosen. So it will have all of these icons right here and on this dice. And there are two spots right here with a blank, and that means that you can choose whichever lane that you want to, and whatever the number on the D12 is, is how high you can move up in that lane. Now, obviously one, you can only go on the one, but if you roll, oh, of course, another one. So there, I rolled a three. So this player right here could go anywhere between one and three. Now, now the way that this works, after everybody has gone, this right here is a zone. There are four zones and you can see that they're marked off kind of with these coins right here and these gear symbols. So the highest player in one of these zones will collect one coin per player in this zone. Now say if both players were sitting at a three, that would be a tie. And essentially you are taking one coin times both of those pawns that are in that section and you're gonna be adding it to the pot. So that would be three coins. And then it continues to go like that. You continue to roll, you continue to move your pawns up and whoever is highest in that zone will collect the pot and the higher that you go up, the higher that you roll, the pot gets larger. So. If you had two pawns up here, let's say one had a higher spot than the other, that is four coins per each pawn that are that is in this location here, in this zone. So there'd be eight coins that blue player would collect. Whoever has the most coins at the end of the game is who wins. Now how you are choosing the length of the games is by rolling the d12 at the beginning of the game and whatever number it lands on is how many rounds that you are playing. Now at any time whenever you are moving and you cannot move, 
you have to pay a dollar. So say everybody rolled a one and all the slots are taken, you would have to pay a dollar because you're unable to place your pawn on any slot on the board. Now, if you have no money, do not worry about it, you are forgiven. You do not have to pay the dollar. Now also, there are uh, a few different ways that you can play this game, uh, pay to play. So essentially you're giving uh, $5 at the beginning of the game, and every time you place your pawn anywhere you want, you have to place a bet, like a dollar. And essentially that is just adding to the pot. So at the end of the game, again, same way, rolling the die, figuring out how many rounds you're gonna play. So at the end of that game, whoever has the most money, so you would end up with more money because everybody is betting. So that is one game that we played. The other game is Double Your Fun. So what that is, and I enjoyed this game a lot more since I was just playing with Nick, and I feel weird saying that instead of my husband because everybody knows who he is now. So Double the Fun is basically everybody gets two pawns instead of one, which makes it a little bit trickier. There's a little bit more strategy to this, which I didn't actually think that there would be that much strategy in this game because you're rolling dice however much you get, except when you're rolling the dice, you can place your pawn anywhere up to that number. So a few times when I was playing with Nick, um, he would purposely try to tie with me to make the pot go up higher in that spot because whenever there is a tie, nobody gains that pot. It is just put in right here. It's just put right here and nobody collects it until somebody actually wins it, whoever's highest in that zone. So he would purposely do that to me so that hopefully anyway, he would win the pot and it would be a larger amount of number. So way more strategy in this game than I thought that there was being just, you know, a dice game. This is a small game and it packed quite a punch. I was excited to play the game just because there's betting in it, kind of betting in it, right? You're playing with money. It's just a quick, easy game that you could probably just get in in between games, something to get out during the day, just something to play with. It's very, it's not a very big box either, like something that you probably put in a backpack, obviously it's not fitting in your pocket, but I think that this would be a very fun game, even just like, I don't know, going on a picnic or something, like kind of a travel game, just because of how small it is. And really you can use any kind of money that you want. And I expected to play this game once, play and then get the heist in. Well, we didn't stop playing this game. We kept playing it because it was just so quick, easy, and fun. I think it says five minutes per round, but I would assume that that's whenever you're playing with a full eight players. And it even said too that you could play this game with more than eight people. You would just need to find um, more pawns that you could play with. And obviously keep track of them because I feel like after eight, that would be a lot. <laughs> and obviously you would be able to play with eight because there's a lot of spots on this board. And I feel like it would just be a lot of fun. Like we had fun playing pay to play. Um, and we actually, we kept that up whenever we were doing the double your fun. So we kept that up too. So paying to play and then playing technically with kind of like four players, it got to be a lot of fun. So if you get this game, try out everything and see, there's surely something in the rule book, some kind of different rules that you can play with that will uh, fit your needs and will tickle your fancy as this game did with me. Uh, so anyway, thank you again to Coldstream Games for sending me these two games. These were two very fun games and I'll link all of their information down below, everything that I have. I will even link their Kickstarter. Their Kickstarter is on, I think from today, uh, for 19 more days on Kickstarter. I hope that you check that out because both of these games were very fun and I assume that Klondike, the Canadian Gold Rush game will be equally as fun. Two Coldstream games, The Heist and Steamrolled. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, uh, why don't you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel so that I can see you next video. Wait, what? What is happening? What is happening? I don't understand this.